All right, if you will, turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. You're uh, reading verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you to the grace of Christ, to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are those who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Well, we've looked in our study so far in Galatians that uh, we've looked at the author, we've looked at Paul. Uh, Paul is, is uh, formerly Saul of Tarsus, who was a, 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 a really a terrorist in the church, uh, terrorizing the church, has been saved by God's grace. So we have a complete 180 in terms of this man who wants to terrorize the church. Now he's an apostle, now he's you know, a, a preacher of the gospel. He's going around uh, these different Gentile lands and planting churches. Notice he says that his apostleship is not from man or through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So in our study, we've seen that Paul has proclaimed his authorship and his apostleship. Uh, he's let these readers know that he has been appointed by God alone. God has appointed him to this position. So in this, he prays for God to give them grace and peace. And so as believers, they're recipients of God's grace and peace. But because these false teachers have come in and disturbed uh, this assembly, he prays for additional grace and peace. He reminds them early on of the importance of Christ's death. You know, he begins to write, uh, as he says here in these opening statements in verses 3 through 5, that it is Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. Why? That he might deliver us from this present evil age. And, and, and that's key to the true gospel. We're not saved so that we can just stay uh, consumed and under the dominion, the power and the influence of this present evil age. We've been delivered from it. And all this is according to God the Father, uh, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so then he switches gears. He goes from teaching the gospel and he begins to lay out in verses 6 through 10 the reason why he picked up the pen to write this letter. He begins to write in amazement. He cannot believe these believers have now, have now turned from the gospel of grace to a works-based system. And Paul will make it very clear. That's no gospel at all. And so in verse 8, um, he says here, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than, uh, to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Um, Oliver Green, on, in his commentary in Galatians, says this, we should look around us and listen to some of the preaching today. If we will stop, look, and listen, we will recognize the Galatian heresy is in this day. Many preachers preach salvation by grace through faith plus works. Oh, they scream, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that's greater than all of our sin. But then in the next breath, they command the parishioners to practice certain do's and don'ts that they'll surely be damned. Well, he's right. Oliver Green's right. We need to be careful who we listen to. We need to make sure that they line up with God's word. And what we mean by that is that as a Christian, we have been saved unto good works. But those good works are not the foundation. They're not the basis of your justification. Only Christ, perfect, his imputed righteousness, is the only grounds of your justification. And notice here. Paul's warning of God's judgment. He says in verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be, highlight that, accursed. Let him be damned. As we said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches to you any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. That, that sit kind of strong to you, right? Anytime we have strong language, it tends to make people perk their ears up. You know, we've got a generation of, of people who do not want to be confronted with the truth and the reality that Paul says, if you preach a false gospel, go to hell. That's what it means to be accursed. And so Paul has some strong language for anybody who would pervert the gospel of grace. Paul is making a direct attack against those who promote a false doctrine, uh, especially in doctrines dealing with the gospel. And what is Paul doing? He's waging war here. Why? Because he loves the truth. He loves the truth. And because he loved those he led to the Lord. And this is biblical. 
Uh, turn, turn back over to Psalm 97. Notice this language here in Psalm 97. I can tell you right now, if Paul came in and preached this message in most churches, they would all take him outside and say, you're so mean-spirited. You're so unchristlike." But notice here what Psalm 97.10 says. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. I mean, this is it. We defend the truth because we love the Lord and we hate evil. So do you hate evil? Do you hate false doctrine? We well, should. You should. Go to Ezekiel 33. What's our responsibility as Christians? We've been given the word. We've been given the truth. So what is our responsibility to this truth and this word? Ezekiel 33. Verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make them their watchman. When he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take the warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood should be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning shall save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his ways. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way. He shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Now, Ezekiel was called to be Israel's watchman and warn them of God's impending judgment if they should fail to repent. I'm sure that's not a popular job back then, no more than it is today, right? But we have been given the same charge as watchmen as well. You know, this is why Paul would say, you know, um, I, I, I am innocent of, of the blood uh, because I have shared with you the whole counsel of God as he talks about in Acts 20. So we're to warn our lost and dying culture of their destiny should they fail to put their faith and trust in Christ. And we're to be watchmen also within the church to stand up against false teaching. Uh, we've not, not been called to ignore the false teaching for the sake of peace. I mean, it is so easy to just sit there and let false teaching go. You know, if I go and confront this person with their false teaching, the way they're conducting themselves, for example, um, it's just going to cause conflict, turmoil. But we've not been called to that. In fact, we have clear instructions. Turn to Romans 16. You know, we talked about this last time. Most Christians do not behave and operate as though the case law is still relevant, right? They don't, they don't go and study the case law. They don't know how to apply the case law. Well, here, here's a case law in Romans 16. I want you to see it. Romans 16, verse 17. Now, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words, flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. That's some strong words, right? But those who reject sound doctrine are to be avoided. You know, if they will not stop promoting false teachings out there, they're to be avoided. Notice here in 2 Thessalonians, so you have a case law, you know, so we don't have to act like we don't know what to do when someone begins to promote false teaching and will not repent and relent of that false teaching. 2 Thessalonians, turn to 2 Thessalonians 3. Second Thessalonians 3, verse 14. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person, do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Now notice here, what's the attitude? What, what, what's our attitude? You know, what's our motivation? You do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Right? Someone who tells me they're a brother in Christ, but yet they're going to practice false things, they're going to lie, uh, they're going to uh, teach false doctrine, they're going to cause divisions. I don't want to treat you like a brother. So how should I treat you? He tells you. You have the case law. You have the, it, it clearly laid out here. Either you relent of your false teaching. 
You relent of your false practices. Oh, we don't keep company with you. And I'm not treating you like an enemy. I'm treating you like a brother. Does that make sense? That's your attitude. You love them so much that you're not going to tolerate them uh, destroying their own lives with their false teachings, their false behaviors. And you're not going to let them be, as Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 5, like leaven or like a cancer within the church to spread the false teaching or to spread the false behavior. You have clear case law giving as to what you do with people like this. You'll see verses like this all throughout the scriptures that um, we are to handle those who promote false teaching um, and, and to handle those who have false ways of living. It, they clearly teach us that. Now, let's just make sure we're clear. I'm not, as a pastor on a witch hunt, looking for, you know, trying to sneak into your house, peeping your window and see what you do at home, right? That's We're talking about people who are so brazen, so emboldened to come up in here and to just start promoting false teaching, promoting false behaviors. Notice Titus 3. Titus 3. These are not isolated case laws. These are not just like uh, some obscure. It's kind of hard. To, it's not really sure what they're saying here. It's pretty straightforward what he's saying. And I think we all get it. Look at verse 10. Reject a divisive man after the first, second admonition. Why? Knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Listen, there may be this case where, you know, you've bought into something. Um, you know, you didn't really fully study out a text correctly and you bring it to bear, and then the elders or other Christians bring it to your attention and say, hang on, brother, that's not correct. You're taking that text out of context. A humble Christian brother would say, oh, thanks for bringing that to my attention. Or they may say, hey, let's discuss this a little more. But false teachers, those who bring division within the church, they're not going to stop with you. What they're going to do is they're going to go and subvert the leadership in the church. They're going to try to find the weakest person in the church to try to come after. So remember, when someone is coming after you with false doctrine, in their mind, they think you're the weak one in the, in the flock, <laughs> right? So they've insulted you to begin with. So how do you protect yourself? you got to know true doctrine, and you got to have um, this watchman attitude to push them back and to put them in a proper place of submission to God's word. You can't allow false teaching just because you like somebody. I've met a ton of people over my experience that are really nice but have no business talking about the word of God because they're so confused on what it says. Notice here in, in 2 Peter 2, just so we're clear, there's no neutral false teaching. There's no false teaching that doesn't bring destruction, right? In 2 Peter 2, in verse 1, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Everything about that, what they're doing is destructive. You, you have to dismiss this idea that it's, yeah, it's just a little bit of false teaching. Well, let's say I gave you a cookie and I told you I only put half a gram of poison in it. It's just a little poison. Just eat it. That's how you need to think of false teaching. All right. So in Galatians 1.8, uh, we read this verse. And, um, you know, how do you test one's ministry, one's teaching? Is it by popularity? If they have a large following, does that mean it's sound? Jesus says in Matthew 24, 11, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. This here in, in 2 Peter 2, if you're still there, uh, notice here in verse 2, it says, and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way the truth will be blasphemed. Large following doesn't mean it's a bad ministry, but it's not the litmus test of a good ministry. So a large following is not necessarily an indicator of a sound ministry. Well, what about miracles and signs? If I could come up here and do some miracles for you, would, would that convince you that it's a sound ministry? Well, not according to Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 23, At that time, if anyone says to you, look here, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ, false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, Paul says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracle signs and wonders. So are signs and wonders the, the litmus test of a sound ministry? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, you think about Pharaoh's magicians. They, they were able to mimic some of God's work, right? So we need to be careful. So what's the test of a faithful ministry, a faithful teaching ministry? Well, Number one, you got to have faithfulness to God's word. Go to Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8. Isaiah 
Isaiah 8, and verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So we need to make sure that a good sound ministry uh, adheres to the word of God. There needs to be a faithfulness to God's word. I, I read something somebody posted earlier this week. It says, sound preaching either causes the sinner to hate their sin or to hate the preaching. Right? If the preaching doesn't cause you to hate your sin or to hate the preacher, then all they're doing is putting a sugary veneer over your sin. Right? That veneer will be melted in hell. Sound teaching always causes you to hate your sin or hate the one who is preaching you to teach you. Turn to First John 4. First John 4. And I can say from experience, I've had some, some set under some good pastors that had told me what I needed to hear that caused me to have a, a true hatred for the sin I was guilty of at that time. But I'm thankful they did. Because that faithfulness to work God's word is what brought me out of deception to think that particular sin was okay. First John 4, uh, look at verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so we understand here, there's going to be these false spirits that teach false doctrine, false philosophies. It, it's, it's happening in our day, right? We're being bombarded on every side with all kinds of false ideology, false doctrines. So how do we test them? We test them against the word of God. How do you test these false spirits? Whether or not they adhere to God's word or not. Turn to 2 John. Look at verse 5. Now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, and that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. One of the hallmarks of a sound ministry is to encourage you to walk in the commandments of Christ, right? Not to walk um, in opposition. He says in verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ is both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Some of these men wouldn't make it in the church today because that just seems so cold, so, so hard-hearted that you wouldn't just receive these people into your house. We should never encourage those that bring false doctrines. Um, we should never... Uh, be hospitable towards those who are going to promote false doctrine and refuse to stop, right? Well, don't you not talk to them? Absolutely, you talk to them. You rebuke them. You bring them the word of God. You set them straight. And here's the thing. I mean, it, it doesn't even matter how well trained you are. Even if you're a leader like Timothy with all of his training and divine truth, he was warned to stay away from false teaching and focus on the pure truth of God's word. And that's the way we should be. I mean, if someone like Timothy has been warned to stay away from false teaching, how much more us? So turn to 1 Timothy 4. Let's look at some of these warnings. First Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having a promise of life that is now and that which is to come. And so the idea here is that you are to reject those profane and old wise fables. In other words, those things that are not in accordance and alignment with the word of God and the truth of God's word. Avoid it. 
it's, it's useless wranglings and arguments, right? So when someone comes in here and tries to push or promote a false teaching, I'm not giving them a platform. You wouldn't want that platform. You wouldn't want them to have a platform. You're not going to give them a basis to try to justify why they're teaching false teaching. You're going to set them straight. You're going to rebuke them once. You're going to rebuke them twice. And then Titus says, you know what to do with people after that. Turn, look at uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 13. Till I come, give attention to reading and exhortation of the doctrine. So why do we do what we do in the church? Because Paul tells Timothy, here's what you're supposed to be doing in the church of God, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. We read the word of God, right? We preach the word of God. And so this is, this is one of the reasons why we do what we do here. Turn to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Look at verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Why do we want to shut down those things that are not in accordance with God's word? It just leads to ungodliness. Who's got time for that? Right? I don't need someone encouraging and, and, and promoting false teaching that would lead me to more ungodliness. So Christ brought the gospel of grace to Paul, and then Paul took it to the churches of Galatia. And in return, those churches were to share it. But then as Paul leaves, these Judaizers come along. They brought a substitution for the gospel uh, that Paul was teaching. So Paul announces a curse on them. He uses this word anathema, which, which means dedicated to destruction. Warren Wiersbe said it this way. No matter who the preacher may be, an angel from heaven or even Paul himself, if he preaches any other gospel, he is a curse. Those are strong words. Why? Well, we need to understand uh, the significance of bringing a false gospel in here. If I bring you a false gospel, I'm leading you astray. I'm getting you to take your eyes off of Christ. And so turn over to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Look at verse 2. Indeed, I, Paul, say that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who tempt to be justified by the law have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in, Jesus, neither, for Christ, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working in love. And so the idea here is, if you look at this passage, we need to be careful we don't pervert the gospel. We need to be careful that we're not guilty of adding works to grace. I mean, this is what they were doing. They were adding something to Christ. And, and if that's the case, then Paul says Christ will profit you nothing. Turn over to uh, Titus 1. Titus 1. Look, jump down to verse 10. Notice this. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. So those that openly um, pervert the gospel, those who openly contradict the Bible, those who openly denounce Christ are an enemy of Christ. And so here's the thing we need to understand. And, and the reason why there's such strong language against those who are inside the ranks of bringing these false teachings is it's not those on the outside. It's not your resident village atheist that's going to bring this assembly down. It's those who subvert themselves and come in and try to destroy the church from the inside out. That's the greatest enemy to the church. In other words, it's those who claim to speak in his name. Those who suddenly, you know, in a subtle way, undermine and distort his true gospel with a system of works righteousness. And so I just want you to understand this. You know, when you go and you look at some of these churches around here, and, and we know people that go to some of these different assemblies, we know their background, we know their lifestyles. We know that in, in some cases that these are young people, for example, who are living in sin. They're living, uh, for example, together out of wedlock. And yet these churches say nothing. Allow that sin to take place without confronting it. That's the hallmark of a false church. Right. 
that you won't even discipline and confront those who are in sin. And so false doctrine leads, by definition, to false living. And they may use Christianese language. They may talk about Jesus. They may talk about grace, but press them to define their terms. Because, you know, one of the most sobering passages in the, in the Bible to me is Matthew 7. Turn over there. Matthew 7. Just using Christian talk is, is not sufficient, right? Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That phrase, Lord, Lord, indicates something of intimacy there. But what we see in these verses is that these people did not have a true intimacy with God. Why? But they had no desire to obey the Father. Intimacy implies you know truly uh, who God is and what he wants and how to obey him. But notice these that Christ said he never knew were basing their salvation on what? Look what we did. Look what we did for you. Right? And that's where you're going to get into trouble. The moment you begin to look at yourself as a source of your salvation, you're treading in deep water and you're, you're not going to be able to tread for long. Your salvation is based only upon the saving work of Christ. And so you must place your faith upon his finished work and his finished work alone. So the works are a result of salvation, not the basis of it, right? In other words, our good works, we are created unto good works. They're the result. They're the fruit of our salvation, not the root of our salvation. You understand the difference, okay? And, and I understand it can be a little confusing because it sounds like we've got to walk a tight line between works-based righteousness and full-blown antinomianism. I'll deal with that in just a moment, okay? So go back to Galatians 1. Go back to Galatians 1. Look at verse 8. If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. All right. So Paul says anyone that brings a different gospel, let him be accursed. I think we all understand what that word means. And this different gospel can reveal itself in two different extremes. What are the two extremes that we see historically uh, people take with respect to the gospel? Well, the first one is legalism. And that's what was going on here in Galatia. These Judaizers were misleading the Galatian churches. Uh, they were bringing in a form of legalism. Uh, the Judaizers uh, is just an extra biblical term we use to describe those that tried to enforce Jewish law upon these Gentiles, Jewish ceremonial laws. Okay? They taught that uh, one had to become Jewish legalistically in order to receive grace and that one had to leave, you know, live legalistically despite grace. And so a legalist would say that uh, not only is some type of law necessary for grace, but it also is necessary to maintain it. And this is what Paul is battling here in the book of Galatians. Um, if, you, if you go back and read Acts 15, you see the Jerusalem Council supported Paul over those who try to bring in things such as circumcision, right? Uh, certainly circumcision is, is a great first extreme. But this issue of adding to the gospel of grace has been played out in history many times. That was the, one of the, the great Reformation issues that they were dealing with, right? Rome, by definition, uh, says that, yes, faith must be there, but so must works. Faith and works leads to justification. You can't get a better example of the Galatian heresy than the Roman Catholic doctrine, false doctrine. Okay, and this is what the early, uh, the early reformers were battling against. And if you read their language, to our modern ears, it seems very harsh, right? But their language is in accordance with the language of the Bible towards those who were perverting the doctrine of grace, who were leading many astray. Everything that Peter talks about in 2 Peter 2 concerning the destructiveness of their false doctrine, that's what they were warring against. That's what they were battling against. The reformers did not come along and say, let's just have this big ecumenical moment. You say Jesus, I say Jesus, let's just kind of get along. No. How are they using the name of Jesus? How are they dealing with the gospel that Jesus brought? It was a distortion, it was a perversion. And so they used very strong language. And that's why, for example, if you read uh, some of the confessional statements, they use very strong language against the Pope, for example, calling him the Antichrist. Well, there's a reason, because he is the spirit of the Antichrist. And so we need to be careful that we don't have these emotional uh, hallmark moments, these little precious moments uh, with these people who are going to hell, who are leading many astray. We need to be comfortable confronting them, being like Ezekiel calls us to be, 
watchmen on the wall. All right, that's the first extreme in abuse of the gospel. Antinomianism is the other extreme. Antinomianism says that I've been saved by grace and the mercy of God, so it's been poured out on me abundantly. He gets all the glory, and he gets all the more I sin, the more glory he gets, right? The more I sin, the more glory he gets in forgiving my sins. And, and this pops up within the writings of Paul. But, but we see this antinomian view in a lot of the church denominations and a lot of the, you know, if, if you're scratching your head as to, you know, I know people that, that said they've responded to the gospel, but boy, it does not look like they've been saved from the power and dominion of sin. Don't really see a lot of fruits of righteousness. Don't see a lot of passion and desire, a real craving and a love for Christ. They bought into a false gospel, Right. So be careful just because someone says, Lord, Lord, we need to be careful uh, that we don't encourage them in, in the assurance of their salvation where the Bible is not encouraging them in the assurance of their salvation. Turn to Romans 3, 8. Romans 3. And why not say, Romans 3, and why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, and their condemnation is just. You know, it appears that uh, based on the doctrine that Paul was teaching, some was teaching his, you know, taking his teaching of salvation by grace, and say, Paul, it sounds like you're, 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 you're saying we have a license to sin. But he's making it clear here, he's making a clear statement, that's not what I'm teaching at all. Turn to Romans 6. Now, when you come to Romans 6, you've got to read it in its context. Paul started in Romans 3.21 all the way to chapter 6. He's been talking about the doctrine of justification by faith. Okay? So when you come to chapter 6, he's dealing with an objection that I'm sure he heard many, many times. Notice the question he asked. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's his answer? God forbid. Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live in it any longer? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Let's just read this. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Any gospel that allows you to still be a slave to sin is not the gospel Paul preached. Okay? For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that he shall also live with him, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead into sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of this great work of grace that take, takes place in your life, verse 12, therefore, because of this great work of grace, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What does the grace of God do? It brings you out from under the dominion of sin. So the antinomian heresy goes against the gospel of grace. Based on the writings of Paul, it seems to me that our presentation of the gospel is a fine line between legalism and antinomianism, right? So when we present the gospel of grace to people, they may get the impression that we have a license to sin, so we need to bring them back towards the center. At that point, they may start to think, well, maybe i got to work to receive and maintain my salvation, and at that point, we need to bring them back towards the center again. The potential for each extreme view of the gospel is there when we present it correctly. But we need to be able to guide people to the appropriate view of salvation by grace alone and Christ alone through faith alone. So let me try to give you an example. Let's just say I've got it all figured out. I've got my gospel figured out. I'm walking in accordance to it. And you can't find one blemish. This is a stretch, but let's just go with it. If you are antinomian and you're on this side of the ditch looking at me in the middle of the road, I'm going to look very legalistic to you. Right? 
But if you're over here and you're legalistic and I'm in the middle of the road, I'm going to look very antinomian to you. The Christian walks the fine line between the two. But this is why we got to get our terms understood and, and, and get our definition straight. This is why it's so important when you're talking to somebody who says, I perceive Christ, but they're definitely under the dominion of sin, right? It's evident. It's clear. We're not talking about the person who has stumbled, sinned, confessed their sin, repented of their sin, and turned back and made things right with Christ. We're not talking about that. That happens to us almost every day, right? We're talking about the one who sins on a habitual basis and doesn't care, and he says, or she says, and rationalizes I walked down the aisle, I said a prayer a long time ago, I'm covered, I'm good, right? We're talking about that individual who has embraced a gospel that says, I can stay in my sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, you're under, you're under the dynamic of grace. That's what Paul says. A true recipient of the gospel is not entangled and in bondage of sin. He can't live there. He doesn't want to live there. Remember we gave the example months and months ago? Let's say conversion is I am converted from being a fish to a human, right? And I used to live in Lake Sin. Now I've been converted out of Lake Sin. Now does that mean I can't walk to the beach that goes to Lake Sin? I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm a human. I'm no longer a fish. Can I walk to the beach? I can do that. Can I get my ankles wet in Lake Sin? I could probably do that. I can do that. Can I get waist deep in Lake Sin? Yes. If I go into water, can I live there? I'm not a fish anymore. I've been converted. I'm a new creation in Christ. I cannot live in Lake Sin. That, that makes sense. That's, the, that's what Paul's trying to get you to understand here. You have been saved by grace. You're no longer under the law. The law doesn't have the power to stop you from sinning. It only tells you what sin is. The dynamic of grace stops you from being under the dominion of sin. That's the true gospel. Okay? Go back to Galatians 1. I'll open this for questions. If you're confused on any of this, the grounds of my justification is the sole work of Christ alone. Right? But as a saved individual, Christ works in and through me. I am his workmanship, created unto good works. Will there be fruit in the life of a Christian? Absolutely, there's going to be fruit. Sometimes tenfold, sometimes thirtyfold, sometimes sixtyfold, sometimes a hundredfold. But you can't be a fruitless tree and say, I belong to Christ. All right? We go back to Galatians 1 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So whether it's restrictive legalism or permissive antinomianism, any teaching that adds or takes away from the gospel of God's revealed truth is a distortion. It perverts the nature of the work of Christ. And so any distortion of the gospel brings one of the strongest rebukes I, I can find in the Bible when Paul says basically go to hell. You can't get any stronger than that. So we have to understand that Paul is speaking hypothetically, for example, in this verse where he says, if he or angels were you know, from heaven would bring a false gospel. What Paul's trying to do with this language is he's trying to find the most effective way to bring the seriousness of this issue to the mind of his readers. We need to understand the seriousness of what he's saying as well. We shouldn't be, you know, so cavalier. We shouldn't be just apathetic to, to the gospel. <coughs> to the gospel and its, and its presentation. One writer said it this way. No messenger, no matter how seemingly godly or good, should be believed or followed if his teaching does not square with the God-revealed apostolic doctrine. Calvin, in his commentary on, on Galatians, says this. In order to destroy more completely the pretensions of the false apostles, he rises so high as to speak of angels. And on the supposition that they taught a different doctrine, he does not satisfy himself with saying that they were not entitled to be heard, but declares that they ought to be accursed. MacArthur says the truth outranks anyone's credentials. And every teacher or preacher must be evaluated on the basis of what he says, not who he is. And that's true. And that's what we're trying to get, you know, that's what we're trying to get to see here in this Bible study. Um, here's the thing we need to understand. Based on the teaching of Peter and, and some of the other writers who write against false teachers, they seem to understand and grasp that false systems appear to be attractive uh, because they emotionally appeal to love or brotherhood or unity or harmony. Uh, many false teachers are popular because they seem to, to be warm and pleasant and claim 
to have a great love for God and for others. I mean, when you sit there and see that smile of Joel Osteen when he's on Larry King, for example, he just looks like a nice guy, right? But everything that comes out of his mouth is utterly false. And you think about the people, the millions who buy his books. Last time I was in Houston, this has been a long time ago, but the last time I was in Houston, he had over 45,000 people showing up at his, his church. They, they took one of the old basketball arenas, and that's their church, right? That's a lot of people to sit there and listen to that much false teaching week after week after week. Well, Paul warns us against the lures of these false teachers. Uh, he tells us in, in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, we looked at this last week, but he tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And here's the problem. When we remain ignorant of God's word, we leave ourselves open, we leave our homes open, we leave our churches wide open to receive all kinds of false doctrine from Satan. William Henderson, he paraphrases Galatians 1.8 like this. He says, even if we or a holy angel must be the object of God's righteous curse, were it any of us to preach a gospel contrary to the one we humans previously preached to you, then all the more divine wrath must be poured out on those self-appointed nobodies who are now making themselves guilty of this crime. There's really no better way to paraphrase that verse than that. So, what does Paul mean by this curse? Well, I think what Paul's saying is that uh, not only should the false teachers not be believed or followed, but they should be left to God's judgment and be accursed. Now, the word curse comes from the Greek word anathema, which refers to one who's devoted to destruction. We already read this in 2 John uh, 7 to 11, but Christians are to have nothing to do with these false teachers. Um, once again, this all implies that we know um, uh, we can discern between false teaching and true teaching. So how do we recognize a false teacher? I mean, right? It, it, isn't that the question, right? If, if these people are you know, they're clever, they use clever words, uh, usually when you meet false teachers, they're not stupid, they're not intellectually dull, they're very creative, they're very sharp, they usually have winsome personalities as well. So how do you recognize them? Well, turn to Jude. You know, the Bible gives you all kinds of examples of, of what to look for in these false teachers. But, um, you know, Jude kind of lays it out better than anybody, I think. <clears throat> look at the first four verses. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, love be multiplied to you. And notice this in verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and denied our only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Just notice that Jude wanted, he wanted to write a nice leisurely letter, right, about the common salvation that we as Christians all share. But something happened, something Something took place. He had to snatch up the pen and write this letter. And in verse 4, he tells us, certain men have crept in unnoticed. And the characteristics of these men are clearly described within these verses. Let's look at them. Number one, they are ungodly men. So what does this word mean? It means to be impious, irreverent. It means that there's no reverence to God or to his word. It means individuals who do not worship the Lord at all. That's what it means. Ungodly means no worship. So ungodly people may give lip service to the Lord, but they will not worship him at all. Any opportunity they can replace the worship of God with some worldly activity, they're going to always pick the worldly activity. Right? You've seen it. You've, you've experienced it. Right? They plan events when we should be gathered together for the public worship of God. They plan events so they can't be there. And God, means no worship. They don't adore him. They don't follow his word. Next, he says... They turn the grace into a license to sin. And, and that's at the heart of antinomianism, right? We just want a license to sin. I don't like hell, but I want to continue to sin and be under the dominion of sin. That's what I want. They deny Jesus. Now, how do they deny him? Well, there's two ways. Either in what you say and in your doctrine or in the way that you live, right? And I believe here it, it was seen in their lives. In other words, I, I don't know that they came in waving banners and saying, I deny Jesus. I deny Jesus. It wasn't that way. It, they denied him with their lives. I mean, look at verse 8. Likewise, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. You know, these are descriptions of these people. So they live a licentious life. They live a sinful life, uh, a perverted life, but yet they use Christian talk, right? 
They're ungodly. They don't have a desire to worship him. Uh, they turn the grace of God into lunacy. And so we just got to keep these things in mind. Uh, the, w the way you can know this is you spend time with them, and, and it'll begin to reflect and, and, and pour itself out. But we see here in verse 8, these are men that defile the flesh, reject authority, and, and speak all kinds of evil. You ever met someone that says, I love Jesus, but they deny God-ordained authority in every area of their life? You ever met people like that? They won't respect and, and submit to their parents. They won't respect and submit to the civil realm, and they certainly will not submit to the, the church realm. Right? Covenant breakers are the best ones, best example. I'm not going to submit to any God-ordained authority. Then in verse 10, look at what they say. Verse 10. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, these in themselves corrupt themselves. So Jude compares them to an unreasoning, unthinking animal. Look at verse 16. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to do what? Gain advantage. Here Jude says they're grumblers. You met people like this? Right? They profess to know the Lord, but it, they, they habitually cannot stop complaining. You say, I just don't know. If I, how would you ever know a, a false teacher or one of these, these people that the Bible is talking about? He's telling you. He's telling you. They walk according to their own lust. They will not submit to any authority. Whatever their lust, whatever their passion dictates at the moment, that's what they're going to do. Even if God's word is very blatantly clear, don't do it. They reject authority. They walk according to their own lust. Oh, and they're good at using words. They are so good at using words. They can manipulate with the best of them, right? And remember, we're not talking about, when you think about a false teacher, if you have the picture of um, Nero or Hitler or somebody like that, you're missing the point here. Those are psychopaths, right? What I'm talking about are these false teachers. They're like, kind of like the Eddie Haskells of the church. Oh, they can tell you what you want to hear when you're in the presence. But the moment you get away from them is a totally different life. They're great at flattering people to tell you what you want to hear. Look at verse 19. These are sensual persons who cause division, not having the spirit. You know what people that cause division? They just love on it. They cause division in the church. They cause divisions within in, in families. This is what they look like. You don't have to scratch your head anymore. You, you don't have to wonder about what they look like anymore. Jude tells you very, very clearly what they're about, what they're like. Well, they're easy to pick out. The problem is that, um, you know, a lot of times you got to get to know people. And, and a lot of times what really fleshes it out is pressure. Whenever they're, whenever, and what I mean by pressure is whenever their will is going against what the church wants, the family wants, the nation wants, whatever it is, right? It's going to flesh itself out. And, and we've used this example a lot of times, but I think it's a good analogy. The old bump in the teacup analogy. What happens when you bump the teacup? Whatever's inside comes out. Whenever these people are bumped, whatever's in their filthy, wicked hearts comes out. That's what's there. So, you know, this idea, well, we just don't know. Now, the Bible gives you a pretty, pretty, pretty good uh, explanation of who these people are, what they're like, what they're about. So, notice this. What's their destiny? Well, go back to Jude 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who longer know were marked out for what? This condemnation. What's their destiny? Condemnation. In other words, these people are going to be destroyed. Look at verse 14 of Jude. Now Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they've committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is their future. And so if this is the future of an apostate, then why in the world would you want to put yourself under their teaching or in their fellowship? It'd be foolish, wouldn't it? So let's ask the question. How do you know whether or not the teaching you're hearing today is true or false? How do you know? How do you know I'm not, I, I'm not, how do you know I'm not one of these classic deceivers just using flattering words to take advantage of you? Well, first of all, there's nothing flattering about what I'm saying. I'm not stroking your ego. But how can you know this? Well, number one, what's the result of the teaching? Where does it lead you? Right? Does it cause you to go closer to Christ, to draw near to him? Because I realize some of the things we talk about in here is tough, and, and you kind of think, 
I can't live that way. I get it. You can't. In your own strength, you're going to fail at everything the Bible tells you to do. But Christ did not leave you without power, without grace. He's told you how to live this kind of life. And so the result of this teaching is I want to drive you back to Christ, right? As sheep, we tend to want to wander away from our shepherd, our great shepherd, right? As his under shepherd, I want to push you back to him. I want you to see the kind of life God asked you to live. I want you to throw your hands up in despair and say, I can't live it. And I'm going to say, good, go back to the shepherd. Because he died, he bought you, he purchased you. By his grace, you can live the kind of life he called you to live. Secondly, if the people you associate with, the people you surround yourself with, allow influence over you, do they cause you to go closer to Christ, to draw near to him? You need to analyze and think about your relationships, right? And when I say relationships, the relationships where they have an influence on you. There's a lot of people I have a relationship with out there that have no, my waking up day to day, that's not influenced by how they behave, right? But there are people who are influential in my life. And are those people who are influential in my life, are they drawing me closer to Christ? If not, am I drawing them closer to Christ? If you're both not drawing one another to Christ, then what's the basis of the relationship? You need to surround yourself with people who are going to make you want to love Christ more and follow him and be more obedient to him. Here's another question. Do the people um, believe more in the scriptures? Do you trust the word of God more based upon the teaching you hear in this church? If there's one thing that I, you know, I probably use over and over again is the same analogy from the very first day we start started here. If you don't know the word of God, you are the easiest ones to deceive. You must know God's word. You have to know God's word if you're going to navigate in this lost and dying world. You should believe the scriptures more. I want you to understand that God determines reality. His word determines reality, not your experience, not what your friends say or what the latest philosophical fads are. Here's another one. Do you desire God more? Do you trust Christ more? Right? You see, false teachers, those that are trying to lead you astray, are going to tell you, Christ doesn't really care what you do with your life. Christ doesn't care how you live your life. He doesn't care about those things. Well, you couldn't reason that from the scriptures because every area of life comes under the dominion of Christ, including your thoughts. You know, this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. You need to bring all your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. So, yes, everything matters to Christ. Well, if these things are not being promoted then we need to go back and rethink what we're teaching. Other teachers you listen to, right? There's some good teachers out there, and we commend them to you. But if you listen to teachers out there that don't cause you to love Christ more, uh, cause, if they cause you to be more self-reliant, more self-independent, right? Um, you need to be leery and stay away from teachers like that. You want teachers that are putting your, your nose in his word, causing you to want to go to his throne of grace and seek his mercy and his grace. Well, go back over to, uh, to Paul here. I hope we're clear on God's case law about this issue of false teaching, those who cause division. His word's not silent on this. Uh, we don't have to act and wander around and make up new rules for what we do with people like that. The word of God is very clear what you do with them. And for those who want to promote and teach a false gospel, Paul has a word. If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than what we have preached, to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what we, you have received, let him be accursed. I understand these are strong words, but they're there in your Bible. According to Oliver Green, it'd be difficult to find anything from Genesis to Revelation more dreadful than this statement. And he's right. You know, it's a difficult verse, but it's a sobering verse, and it ought to get us our, get our attention that what we listen to matters, and the gospel we proclaim most definitely matters. We do not want to be guilty of promoting and pushing a false gospel. Paul says, if anyone brings a different gospel than the gospel of grace, let that one be dropped into hell. In the words of one, do not let him deliver any message except the message of the grace of God. Let me just end uh, this little section here with these final words. Toleration of the distortion of grace um, will compromise and weaken your testimony. Right? If, if your gospel makes you look no different than the people in the world, why come? Right? If we're going to live like the world, 
and not live in accordance to the salvation we say we've received, why would someone want to come to Christ? So there's no way you can sit under teaching that distorts the gospel of grace and not have it affect you. There's no way you cannot be influenced. If you surround yourself with people outside this church who are weak on the gospel, who have compromised lives, who live lives of just sin, they're entangled in sin, no real fruit of salvation, no, no peaceable fruits of righteousness describes their homes, right? It will impact you. This is why Paul says, bad company corrupts good character. That's not my teaching. That's Paul's teaching. Be very clear on this, right? You need to settle in your mind what the Bible teaches about the gospel and commit yourself to that. And as we come into contact with these individuals out in our culture, out in our community, you know, who go to churches who allow fornication to take place and nobody says anything, right? Those who embrace alternative lifestyles. An alternative lifestyle is just another way of saying perverted lifestyles, right? When you come to contact with those kinds of people, we need to warn them. We need to warn them that they fall into a false gospel. John Calvin writes, to know what are the leading points of the gospel is a matter of unceasing importance. And he's right. Paul is exhorting these churches to stand firm on these serious convictions that the gospel that they receive is the true gospel and that they should embrace it. Calvin further writes, nothing can be more inconsistent with the nature of faith than a feeble, wavering assent. What then must be the consequence if ignorance of the nature and the character of the gospel shall lead to hesitation? And that's true. If you're not sure about what you believe, you're going to hesitate. If you don't really understand the good news, you'll never share the good news. You'll be tossed to and fro from every wind of doctrine. You're going to be whipsawed. You know, you're going to come in here on Sunday and hear us teach a gospel that says God saves us from the power and dominion and tyranny of sin. But at the moment you walk out of here, you go and you hang out with individuals who are just under the, under the bondage of sin. You're going to be whipsawed week in and week out. Week in and week out. You're never going to get this straight in your mind. You need to ask yourself, does Christ save us so that I can live like the world? Does Christ save me so that I can stay under the tyranny and bondage of sin? If that's the gospel you believe, you're going to find a lot of people out there to surround yourself with, and it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe that the gospel actually teaches what we just read in Romans 6, then you're going to surround yourself with people who are not under the bondage and tyranny of sin. Because you're going to want to know, how in the world are they living this way? By what power do they walk? These people seem to be consumed with a love and a passion for Christ. It's not faith. They really live out what they mean. And when they don't, they, they confess it to Christ and, and they repent. Their houses are ordered and structured. Their homes are ordered and structured. Their businesses are ordered and structured. The way they carry themselves is ordered and structured. Well, you need to understand and settle in your mind what you believe about this gospel. Oliver Green writes these words. This man, Paul, preached because preach he must. Right? He was called of God, ordained of God, sent by God, and he must give an account to God. Therefore, he preached the pure gospel. Put your name in this text. You must give an account to God. You are called of God. You are ordained of God. You've been sitting by God. You've been commissioned by God, and we will all give an account. So preach the pure gospel. That ought to be our philosophy. We've been called of God, ordained of God, sent of God to preach the gospel. So preach the gospel to this world. And we need to be reminded that this message has not changed since Christ has come upon the scene. And we need to resolve within our minds that any other message um, than this truth that we're talking about here is not acceptable. And so the man who preaches any other message of the, other than the true message is not acceptable. And um, Paul would have some strong words for that. If you preach a false gospel, that should be a curse. That ought to just sting and make you pause and at least want to go home today and say, I need to get my mind around this gospel thing. I do not want to be guilty of preaching a false gospel. Well, let's stop here. Uh, Paul's going to talk uh, about a principle here in verse 10. Uh, you know, we, we should all struggle with this. Do I persuade men of God? Do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You're a slave to man or slave to Christ? Lord willing, we'll pick up here next weekend. Next week, I'm going to challenge you on, on this principle uh, because you're a servant to somebody. The question is to who. So Lord willing, we'll come back, continue to read this first chapter, continue to meditate upon it, and, and we'll continue to flesh these, these principles out.